I'm Drew Stevenson. This is for my professional responsibility class. And here we're going to be talking about an ABA formal ethics opinion from 2021 that clarified one of the critical phrases or terms in Model Rule 1.9 and Model Rule 1.18. And so what we're talking about here is um, conflicts involving materially adverse interests. And this is from ethics opinion uh, 497 in 2021. So let's dive in. It, rules 1.9a and 1.18c cover conflicts for current clients with interests that are materially adverse. Those are the words it's used to the interests of a former or a prospective client on the same or substantially related matter. But neither rule really specifies what counts as materially adverse. It's a term that's not used in the other conflicts rules besides 1.9 and 1.18. So they give some examples, and I think it's helpful to know these for purposes of test questions. If you see a test question about one of these, you should just assume that the, the ethics opinion has said that this clearly or automatically falls into the category of what the rule prohibits. So negotiating or litigating against either a former client or someone who came in for a consultation on the same or closely related matter, or attacking the work that you did for a former client. So for example, um, you drafted a contract for one client and later on you're trying to help another client get out of the contract or rescind the, their con the co same contract from their end, or cross-examining a former client or someone who came in for a consultation, if the consultation was about the subject matter that they're going to be testifying about in that case. Um, note that the representation could be materially adverse to a former client, even if they're not a party to the current matter, as when a lawyer is attacking their prior work for a former client, it's going to depend on the facts. There are some things that are not a conflict of interest, so just generalized financial harm or a claimed detriment that's not accompanied by demonstrable and material harm or risk of such harm to the former or prospective client um, or client's interests uh, would suffice, according that's to quote the ABA's ethics opinion. So the fact that you do a consultation for uh, a client, uh, for a prospective client, decide not to represent them or they decide not to hire you, and then you turn around and represent their industry rival in an unrelated matter. It's not, you didn't get any information that related to it. This doesn't apply. We're not concerned, even though they hate each other or are, are bitter, bitter competitors in the marketplace. Let's talk a little bit about cross-examining a former client or somebody that for whom you did a consultation. Courts sometimes find materially ad, material adverseness um, when a lawyer tries to examine a former client, even where the lawyer doesn't actually use information from the prior representation, or maybe the information has become generally known, like it's a public figure and the news media has already reported the information. So in that case, it's not confidential anymore, but it's also possible that you have confidential information, but you don't actually need it to bring it out during the cross-examination. Um, even so, the ABA recommends having the current client retain a separate counsel to examine the former client and screening the lawyers, any lawyers who have information that could they could use, whether they would or not, what that they could have used from participating in the exam examination. When we say screening, we mean they're not going to share info with the lawyer who's doing it. And so if you have a firm and they're providing representation, one of the lawyers did a consultation or represented a former client. And even if they're not a party to this current matter, but um, some of the lawyers have information that they could use, those lawyers shouldn't be the ones doing the cross-examination. Have another lawyer from your firm come in and do that. Now, let's talk about consent and waiver for just a moment. Rule 1.9 and Rule 1.18 both allow a lawyer to proceed with representing a current client against a former client or a former prospective client, that's someone who came in for a consultation, if the lawyer obtains informed consent confirmed in writing from all the affected parties. So if you have a test question and 
they um, uh, pay attention to whether uh, all the relevant clients, the affected cl um, clients or affected parties give informed consent because then you don't have to really analyze whether it's materially adverse or anything like that. Um, that also, they could um, give you authorization specific to disclose or um, use information without necessarily consenting to a, a breach of loyalty, like a, a conflict of interest, but maybe they assign something saying you, I, I, this information, your f firm is free to use or something like that. Of Obviously that would also require express consent. I, we, the ABA opinion gives a few examples, and I think these are really helpful for illustrating um, the conflicts of interest rules generally and how they come up in practice. So I'm going to talk about um, the, uh, two or three examples quickly here. But the first is Zerger and Maurer v. City of Greenwood. I have this citation here in the image if you really want to look up the case, but you're not responsible for the case for my class. Just listen to this is for purposes of illustration. So you have this city in uh, Missouri, Greenwood, that brought um, a and settled a nuisance claim against a local rock quarry over the truck traffic. So this this was a nuisance. These trucks that carry uh, rocks and gravel make a lot of noise and dust and things like that. And it was bothering everybody in the town that um, there's this huge rock quarry and there's all these trucks. So they sued them in nuisance and won a uh, settled the case. And the settlement provided that the city could designate specific routes that the quarries trucks would take that wouldn't bother, uh, let's say, be through a residential area or be on Main Street. It might be out of the way. They might have to go out of their way, but that they get to designate the truck route for the quarry. So far, so good. But then the same firm, Zerger and Maurer, that had represented the city in this litigation later brought a private nuisance action against the quarry on behalf of the homeowners among the new route. So the city said, okay, we want you to take this route that kind of bypasses the most densely populated or uh, areas or the shopping areas of town or something like that. Well, the people who now have all the trucks rolling past their house all day don't like it. So they want to bring their own action for nuisance and hire the same firm that sued the rock quarry before. So note that the city wasn't a part of this second action, right? They got what they wanted. And from their perspective, the uh, the rock quarry is complying with the settlement decree, but the city intervened to ask the court to disqualify the firm in this case, that being Zerger and Maurer. And the court agreed. The court disqualified the firm, saying that it was advocating a position that contradicted a term in the settlement. So you obtained a settlement that the truck routes are going to go a certain way as a town, whatever the town picks. But now you're suing on behalf of the people that live on the, that route. That, and if you prevail, the rock quarry is going to have to use a, a different route than the one the town picked. So you, this is a type, a, a, a way that what you're doing will contradict what you achieved on behalf of a previous client. Here's another example. National Medical Enterprises v. Godfrey. Again, I have the citation um, here on the picture. Um, this, by the way, a hospital is not the one from this case. It's just a, a free picture that I got of a hospital. So this is about a hospital. And the hospital got in a lot of trouble. They faced criminal act charges and civil actions, basically for both for mistreating patients and for defrauding insurers. And so it was a big case, or a cluster of cases. And there was a firm, Godfrey's firm, who represented one hospital administrator, um, and it, that administrator denied any wrongdoing in all of these cases and was never charged and was never found guilty as a civil defendant. So they weren't, this is a particular, let, let's say, administrator or mid-level employee at the hospital who um, got dragged into the cases, but never admitted wrongdoing and eventually was ne he was, wasn't the defendant in any criminal cases and the civil cases against him were dropped. And then at some point, the firm withdrew from representing this administrator. And then later, the firm sued the same hospital on behalf of a large group of former uh, patients. So now we're going to have a follow-up litigation that's some sort of 
maybe class action or something. So even though the hospital administrator, a former client, was not part of the case, he wanted the um, court to disqualify the lawyer because the lawyer uh, knew and talked to him confidentially about his role. And that could come up in this new case. He could end up getting dragged into the new case, and he didn't want that. So um, he had in adverse information about the individual was too likely to arise, the court said. So the firm that represented this administrator couldn't be involved in a new round of litigation that was basically over the same thing, over uh, abuse, of, widespread abuse of the patients by the hospital staff. Here's a counterexample, and I don't even have the case name, just to, for purposes of illustration. A lawyer represented a company that was exploring a, a claim against another company over a defective product. So you have company A and they buy, let's say, parts um, for something they produce or something they do, a service they provide from company B. And company B produce, it sells them a defective product, so they turn around and want to sue. And they hired a lawyer at least to do the exploratory stage for this potential contemplated litigation. Ultimately, the company decided that the case wasn't worth it and decided not to bring the case um, partly because they had an otherwise really longstanding lucrative relationship with this vendor, and they didn't want to jeopardize that with litigation. So they decided to just lump it, cut their losses, and keep the per their, the contract they had because it was a sweet deal for them and that they didn't want to jeopardize. So the, that lawyer, though, later wanted to represent the retired founder of the company, of the, the company that he had represented, so presume, so this is a company and they have a, a founder who is now retired. And it makes sense that when he has a legal matter that he needs to handle, that he would want to hire the lawyer that he knew from when this case was going on. But this is a, this person, this uh, former president or founder of the company, wants to sue the same defendant on an unrelated claim let's say it's defamation or a different product or something. Well, the court said this is so different, right? We're not, uh, it's a retired individual who wasn't really involved in the previous contemplated litigation. It's an unrelated claim, so there's no conflict of interest. And that concludes our discussion about materially adverse um, interests for purposes of conflicts of interest analysis under Rule 1.9, and 1.18.